What are we starting with this week? A Patreon thank you. Thank, thank you, you, patrons. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. If you want to join our Patreon, you could go to patreon.com forward slash guys, where you can get a whole bunch of cool things. You can vote on episode topics. You can submit episode topics to vote. You get two extra... Wait, you get one extra show and bonus episodes of this show and you also get access to our live show whenever you want only after we've done it obviously you can't get it for future live shows what's your favorite animal let's start the show let's start the show Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp and Luke Upfer. Hello. Hi, howdy. This week, we're talking about smart cephalopods. Now, what are cephalopods again? I've forgotten. Are they like a little crustacean? No. Cephalo meaning brain, pod meaning leg. Brain, brain leg. leg. Brain leg or head leg. That's what, what a what? snake is. It's a brain and then a leg. It's not a leg, that's a tail. Think uh, about it's a back. Think about um Spine. think about what animals, perhaps in the ocean, consist of legs and a head. And just Jellyfish. legs and a head. No, they don't have a head. They kind of have a thing approximating a head. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Heads and legs in the ocean. Yeah. Uh crabs. No. But we will we will talk talk about crabs. Octopus. Yes. Ah, oh, I was close with jellyfish. Squid. <laughs> octopus. Squid. Yeah. Cuttlefish. Those are all. Those are all cephalopods. Yeah. No. Your jellyfish is not close at all. <laughs> <laughs> it looks close. The thing with close. a big blob and then some some little <laughs> tentacle things. <laughs> like you, you think about it, it seems obvious, right? An octopus is literally just head, legs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all heads, yeah. all legs. So. Um, yeah, we're talking about smart cephalopods. So an octopus, um, the plural is... Octopi? Yes, or? Octopi. Octopuses. <laughs> oh, octopuses, okay. Um, I think you could also go with octipodes, but I, I think Oct that's... That sounds like a, like a philosopher. <laughs> Octipodes. Yeah, so I mean, because it, it's Greek. <laughs> yeah. He wrote. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, there are a bunch of different octopuses. What do you know about octopuses? Eight legs. Yeah. They live in Very the ocean. Very smart. Mm. They have mm. a little beak. Yep. They have a little... Wait, no, is that squid? I can't remember. They have ink sacs, one of them. Yep, they could. Octopuses yeah. can also shoot ink sometimes. They can oh, yes, use they tools. Can. Yeah. They can use tools, yes. What kind of tools can they use? They can use sticks to sort of break stuff. Mm -hmm. Important, yeah. Yeah. They can Stones. use. Stones. Uh, breaking bones, I'm sure. Um, they can. So there's a specific octopus that has been known to uh, use coconut shells and just carry them around as like protection. Mm. They can predict the outcome of football games. They can. Mm. And elections. No. Yeah. yeah. No. No. Yeah. Prove it. No. <laughs> Wait. No. You prove that they can. Yeah. Prove that they can. No, no, you prove they that have. they can. There's plenty of proof that they yeah. can. That's not predicting. That's a fifty-fifty chance. More. They get more than fifty-fifty though. Yeah, but like, come on. <laughs> okay. What makes you think that this octopus can actually predict the future? Because it was right. Okay. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Professor Trelawney was right sometimes. Yeah. She was wrong most of the time. But she was right sometimes. And she Three still times. taught divination. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh my god. An octopus could do a better job than Professor Trelawney. I mean, a horse could do a better he job than... down tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine an octopus in those glasses, though. <laughs> anyway. So, octopus, um, they've got eight legs, obviously. They can be as small as five centimeters long, up to... Um, 5.4 meters um, excuse with, me what yeah with um with uh like an arm span of almost nine meters um it's the largest octopus yeah. but usually octopuses have got um like so they, they've got like a sort of like their body is kind of like a sack i guess their head is like basically attached to the body like attached to the body like and it's the same thing as the body it's, it's hard it's not very distinct. i guess distinct from the body yeah um uh, big eyes. It says big complex eyes, eight contractile arms. Uh, they've got suckers on their arms, which are very strong. Um, they've got like a sort of skirt that got joins. Skirt. Yeah, like so the, you know how the, the sort of their, where their arms join to their body. Like webbed feet. Yeah. 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 Kind of like, yeah, but webbed legs, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, they can, oh gosh, they've got, um, they've got a beak, um, mm. which is the only thing. So an octopus can get in and out of pretty much anywhere, anywhere that its beak can fit in. 
usually because they're 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 just squishy a squishy sack mm. of stuff mm. so they can squeeze in and out of like tiny little holes um they, they've got like a siphon which they can like shoot water out of which they can use for jet propulsion like sometimes a Dalek. sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> daleks do actually kind of look like octopuses yeah yeah when they're out of their sort of shells so they can if they're scared they can shoot some ink or they can just quickly get away uh by shooting water through a siphon sort of that sort of like um water sort of a propulsion there mm. um they're they've also uh they've, they will usually they walk around they walk along the ground and the the, the seabed mm -hmm. with the legs um some octopuses can change colors and i think i can't remember the exact um name of the octopus um it is uh the uh the common octopus um it is medium sized but also every single chromatophore every single color changing cell on its body has pretty much a direct link to its brain so wow. it can it's very highly controlled in the colors that it can change to. So there are octopuses that can, you know, like basically mimic other animals. Um, like a number yes, of other animals. They can, like they sea can, snakes, they can yeah. uh, impersonate like a cuttlefish, I think I've seen. Uh, uh, so a cuttlefish just looks like an octopus. Oh, uh, okay. So there's something there's something where they like they look like almost like a crab type of thing. Oh yeah. Probably. And they go like really long and then they use their legs to look like a long shell. Mm. Wow. That's really weird. So there's that you can I think they can do lionfish as well. Um they can lots of different kinds of things. They can just approximate that by changing colours and um like using their tentacles, changing the size of different parts of their body. It's great. I've seen one like also impersonate like a, like a sort of sea snake, mm. which is fantastic. Mm. Um so yeah, they're they're very smart, um, obviously, um, and like I said, uh, in two thousand nine, um, they they reported a scientist reported of the veined octopus uh, digging out coconut shells from the bottom of the ocean and using them, uh, carrying them around as shelter. That's cool. so cool, yeah, right? Like a little helmet. Yeah, like a little octopus helmet, just uh, carrying it around, and being like, okay, cool, I might need this at some point, and then. Pulling it, uh, I think they can basically just cover themselves with the mm. with the coconut shell. I am coconut, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first, by the way, the first time that we'd sort of uh, viewed uh, or seen an invertebrate, an animal without a backbone, um, uh, using tools, which is pretty cool. So octopuses are smart. Do you know something maybe about octopuses that uh that might have that might have happened recently, perhaps in November of twenty twenty one? They. Found more of them? No. Oh, no. no idea. So they were declared legally sentient in the UK. Yes, oh, I saw yeah. this. Yes. So what is first off? Why don't we get on to like what sentience is? No, do you know what? We'll get on to what sentience is after that. We'll first just say uh, what what's going on with this whole sentience thing. Basically, uh, in the UK, uh, basically nothing has changed. By the way, in the UK, you can still do pretty much everything that you were able to do to lobsters and crabs and octopuses and squid. Before they were declared legally sentient, they've just been declared legally sentient, and this is going to impact future legislation. But oh. current legislation has not changed. Has crab, have crabs been declared yeah. sentient? A cow sentient? Yeah, all vertebrates are sentient oh, legally. Okay. So we'll get onto what sentience is because it may be confusing. Mm. Um, so all um, all vertebrates are sentient um, legally in the UK. Um, a lot of invertebrates aren't, but these ones they've they've decided um, these crustaceans, so decapod crustaceans like lobsters and crabs, are um, sentient according to according to science now. Uh, same with um, octopuses and squid and other cephalopods. So, what does that mean? What is sentience? Like aware of self? No, no. not even that. No, no. So, mm. um, not necessarily. So. Sentience has a, a number of different sort of, uh, sort of definitions. So I've got a couple here for you. One is from the RSPCA, um, which says uh, that you've got, that sort of animals have got the capacity to experience positive and negative feelings like pleasure, joy, pain, and distress that matter to the individual. So you don't need to be like sort of aware of. Do you know I mean, that's, you don't need to have that sort of self awareness. You just need to be able to feel those feelings. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, but in this report, I mean, and actually a, a while ago. Uh, people didn't think that fish could feel pain uh but like you know i mean i think this would have probably like before 2010 they discovered that fish can feel pain but up to that point they were like oh yeah fish can't feel pain right all you had to do is like if you just caught one fish and just <laughs> saw it flailing in pain yeah mm. probably would have been able to be like yeah well there's mm, obviously there's, there's an obvious i know that there's like an automatic response it could be mm. um but if you like cut a fish 
I'm sure it reacts to that. I guess, yeah, yeah that could also, be, a, yeah, could also be an automatic response, I so guess. So we'll get into it. So in this report that we're looking at, so the London School of Economics, LSE, um, actually published a report that was looking at all of the sort of, sort of the, looking at as much of the science as possible uh, to determine whether, um, essentially, octopuses and these uh, crustaceans should be declared as sentient in the UK. So, um, in this report, essentially sentience, and I'll just read this verbatim, it says sentience is a capacity to have feelings, such as feelings of pain, pleasure, hunger, thirst, warmth, joy, comfort, and excitement. Um, it's not simply the capacity to feel pain, but the feelings of pain, distress, or harm, um, broadly understood, have special significance for animal welfare law. Yeah, so a lot of people think the sentience is like, oh, I can feel pain. Obviously, it's more than that. But when we're looking at legislation, uh, we don't really care about making animals feel good. We don't need to legislate that. We just need to legislate not making them feel bad. If that makes sense. Yeah. Because we want to use them and kill them and eat them. I and... think we should legislate making them feel good. Every cow gets a blanket. And a massage. A pass it into... Yes, a massage. massage. Very good. Yeah. Pass that into law. Yeah. Weekly. Why? Weekly. Weekly massage yeah. plus bank. Well, if you're going to kill them and eat their body, at least give them a blanket and a massage. Every week, though, I feel like that would you'd quickly run out of blankets. Mm. There'd be a there'd be a UK wide, a worldwide perhaps blanket shortage. Then you have to make more sheep, make more blankets. Well, then the sheep are being exploited. Look, what do you do? Give the the sheep, sheep not get blankets. Sheep, uh, the sheep. Well, the sheep grow their own blankets, so they don't need a blanket. But you could give them a massage. Well, if you shear the blanket well, off the, them, well, well you yeah. need a blanket. But then the sheep and the cows aren't equal. Oh, uh, I mean, sheep and cows are not equal. They are different. <sighs> wow. Different. So you're saying that things that are different can't be equal and deserve like, different rights. <sighs> God. Buddy. Oh, no. Buddy, what have you done? Uh oh. So, sentience, as we've said, is the ability to sort of, the capacity to have feelings like pain, pleasure, all, all that stuff. They can be positive or negative. They don't need to be, you know, uh, they don't need to be just negative. We just focus on negative in sort of legislation. And sort of additionally, you don't necessarily need to be aware that you're feeling those feelings. That's not necessary for sentience. You just need to feel the feelings, you know? Mm. Yeah, I don't really know how that works, but yeah. So a bug, for example, is unlikely to be able to feel pleasure or um, pain or whatever, right? Well, or it seems that, like, as, as in, far as we're know, as far as we seem to be aware, most bugs don't feel um, sort of pleasure or warmth or comfort. Do you mean that they don't have like a subjective consciousness? Because that is ultimately, if if an organism generates the feeling pain in order to move away from something, but doesn't have a a central subjective consciousness, then it doesn't like I that's can kind of the question. Answer your isn't questions it? in a more roundabout way. If we get to the criteria that they use in this, it'll probably help you understand. Yeah, but I think that I think <laughs> I think the way you legislate something and the way you philosophize about something are possibly different. Sure. So especially when you're the, living in a world where you like kill loads of things so the trap them in cages for their entire lives it's like well i'm not really interested in what the yeah. legislators are doing here they're to this is talking in more of a sort of scientific context because they're basing it off of scientific studies right yeah um but all i mean is that it's a scientific context the science has no idea what consciousness is and how it so like, we're, we're no talking idea so so that is ultimately what i mean is that is ultimately what matters but sent well yes and no i mean sentence sentience doesn't necessarily require um, so it literally says here, um, a sentient being is conscious in the most elemental, basic sense of the word. It need not be able to consciously reflect on its feelings as we do, or to understand the feelings of others. To be sentient is simply to have feelings. Mm. So like, sentience needs consciousness in that it needs you to be able to feel feelings. That is what it is. Yeah. But it doesn't need any higher consciousness Consciousness beyond that. Mm. You just need to be able to feel feelings. Yeah, that makes sense. of course. I But... Yeah, I'm just surprised that they're talking about consciousness because that is ultimately un not measurable. You're making an assumption that there's consciousness there. Yeah, but I mean, so that is you're, you're not making a, the, the assumption that the assumption that consciousness is there. You're if you're saying it depends on consciousness in air quotes at the most basic level, you can kind of disregard that because what it, sentience is just being able to feel feelings, right? You don't need to understand what consciousness is or really have a strong definition for it. You just need to be able to feel feelings. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you can ignore you could ignore the concept of consciousness in this discussion. Well, well, it depends. I mean, I mean depending on what you're defining, being able to feel as. feelings. Consciousness is the thing that feels the feeling. I mean, is it though? Yes. But no. But what I mean is like, okay, right. But do you need to understand what? Do you need to understand fully what consciousness is to talk about 
whether something can feel or not. You don't need to, well, you don't need to understand what consciousness is, but you need to make the assumption that it is there. Kind of, but you don't need to, again, this is why there's there's different definitions for consciousness. Um, and using the most basic one of being able to feel feelings, yep. that you're not making any assumption about any of the other stuff. You're saying this is able to feel feelings. That is, that but is, you're, but you, I don't even know if you're able to feel feelings. I assume yeah, that but you are. The, the, but then there, are the, 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 but when you get to that point, you'd start then having to say, well, we don't know if anything is real. So then, why sure. study anything? Yeah. So <laughs> no, but it's so, an assumption that it's there. It, it, that's yeah, fine. Sure, but then it's, the, the, the same... presupposition is that um, you make the assumption that the animal has subjective consciousness which is ultimately an assumption and we can never prove and we don't even know how it's generated or where it comes from in the same yeah, yeah. but in the same in the same sense that it's an assumption that i am not the only being in the universe and yeah. every and everything else is a is a like you know is a construction of, of my own sort of um, sure. mind but what is the how how do you okay so what knowing that you can't test for that how do they m like measure or decide whether something has the ability to feel feelings. Well, I'll get to that. I was. I just. I just Is said. It whether to you. it reacts to it or like. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell. I'll tell you. I just said that. Uh, I just said that I would. It'd, it'd help if I did it in a more roundabout way. Um, so, there are like, um, you know, I'll, I'll skip ahead. Fine. Uh, there are sort of eight criteria that they used in in this study. Um, so. One is the so the first criteria is the uh, is having uh nos nociceptors nociceptors basically pain receptors. Um, the second is integrative brain regions. Um, and then the third is connections between those integrative brain regions and the pain receptors. Um, for the fourth is responses affected by potential local anesthetics or painkillers, essentially. Um, so your response, um, it basically, you, the, the pain response is affected by local anesthetics or painkillers. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fifth is motivational trade-offs between the cost of threat and the potential benefit of obtaining resources. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, so you can recognize that there is a, a potential harm, mm -hmm. and uh, you can weigh up that potential harm with the benefit of gaining resources. Um, that, that you could weigh up the benefits of gaining those resources, uh, despite the fact that they may incur potential harm. So that's kind of like um, planning, um, and then what decision you decide to take out is based on whether the whether pain will be experienced. I mean, you say planning. I don't. I don't. Doesn't. I don't think it necessarily needs to encompass planning. In that, like, you could be reach, you could be trying to get to a resource, yeah, and there could be a sort of um, a cost yeah. associated with that, like a threat associated with that, as in pain cost. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Pain like cost. Bart Simpson and electrocuting cupcake. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's whether you are then less likely to go and get the cupcake if you've been electrocuted. You, we're being very specific here. So like, it's it's more about it, it's literally just um, you're. Having the having the ability to sort of trade off between how much is too much sort of pain before mm -hmm. the resource is uh, no longer worth it sort of thing, right? So it doesn't necessarily need to have plan. Like, again, I feel like we're adding too much on top of it. It doesn't need to have like uh, an extreme degree of planning or anything. It could be a sort of in, more in the moment sort of thing. So is it is it like um, whether um, a behavior of getting a resource is is potentially down? play down regulated when there's pain involved i wouldn't say down regulation that sounds more like um habituation right and habituation is kind of like a waning of response to a stimulus um and it's it's not that it's specifically not that so it's it is i, I try and think of it more as a sort of in the moment motivational trade-off there could be planning involved obviously with humans there's planning involved but like it doesn't necessarily mean to need need to be like um, a maintained down regulation of whatever behavior it is just you're motivated by uh, gaining a resource um or pleasure or whatever um and you're also motivated to not do something based on um sort of negative experience the negative feelings and it's right the basically the trade-off between the level of negative and the level of po positive does that make sense so is this is this that um you're motivated because you anticipate that pain will happen or once you've experienced pain, trying to get. I don't a know. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't say specifically whether it's yeah. an anticipation or whether it's a. And I don't think it really matters. I think it could be either. Okay. And so the the sixth one is then flexible self protective tactics used in response to injury and threat. Right. So instead of just having like an inbuilt response, so like we've got like a reflex action, 
Um, wherein if I touch something hot, my body automatically will pull mm. away before my pain receptors even get involved, right? Mm. Usually. Or before like uh, the pain receptor send a signal fully to my brain and like there is there is just a quick mm -hmm. pull away, right? Um, that's not really a, a flexible self-protective tactic. That's like an inbuilt, like hardwired sort of thing. Mm. Um, a more a flexible self-protective tactic would be um, something like more akin to like, I touch something hot, I like the stove, mm. and I realize the stove can be hot. I should be careful about touching that again, right? So like learning. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah kind of, yeah, kind of like that, in that sense. Um, and I mean, and, and not even just like learning. Um, it's it's more a case of like, okay, um, so do, do, so there's the reflex action, right? But if something is more complex, mm. I can take a complex action to yeah that is not hardwired into, and that's the flexible part. Yeah, it's like higher reasoning. If my shoe, if the, okay, right, if there's something, if there's a stone in my shoe, right, mm -hmm. there's no reflex action for me to get rid of that. I have to then be like, I'm in pain, mm. and then I take my shoe off, and there's a stone in my shoe, and I get rid of the stone in my shoe. Yeah, right. That would be a more sort of flexible. Um, self-protective tactic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the seventh one, uh, the seventh sort of criteria is associative learning, uh, which is essentially learning that goes beyond um, habituation. And habituation is essentially uh, the sort of downregulation, the decreasing of a behavioral response um, in, res in, in response to a stimulus. Um, basically because, um, I'll just read out this out verbatim and then kind of, just, and then kind of, uh, Talk about it after. So habituation is the waning of an animal's behavioral response to a stimulus as a result of a lack of reinforcement during continual exposure to the stimulus. Um, usually, so it's basically like losing behaviors that aren't needed, right? Basically, if you've got a behavioral response mm -hmm. that is supposed to sort of um, in in response to a specific stimulus, but um, like a nice smell of toast, sure. But that behavioral response isn't then necessary. Uh, to protect you from that stimulus like the stimulus isn't causing any any sort of like um harm or in any way um or it's it's not being the that behavioral response is not being reinforced then you will start to lose that you can start to lose, lose that behavioral response right so i mean i guess right. so let's like you start, like so sort of being startled by something right mm -hmm. um if if i was to come up behind you and startle you like every single day mm -hmm. but there wasn't any negative anything negative associated with that other than just being startled, mm. you would start to be stop being start, startled. You start, yeah, you'd start to stop being startled, right? right? That would be kind of habituation. So there's like there's nothing to reinforce the response, and so the response starts to decrease. Right. When I um, when I was little, I went to a science museum, mm -hmm. and they had a little machine there where you put both fingers on, mm -hmm. and it sends an electric current through you, and it feels really weird. Mm -hmm. um, so the first time I used it, I like mm -hmm. threw my fingers back, but over time, I kept like putting my fingers back on, and eventually, I could just hold it there, mm -hmm. and it felt weird, but I could it wouldn't. I wouldn't like throw my fingers back. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So th that'd be that'd be much that'd be like a sort of habituation, yeah. and um, that is not associative learning. So any learning that is any learning beyond that um, would indicate um, sentience. So if it's just a case of like, oh, you get a response and there's nothing to reinforce it, and so you stop giving that response, that doesn't indicate sentience. But anything, mm. any learning beyond that does indicate sentience. Does that make sense? Yeah, because that could be that can be done without sentience. Exactly. Like, because it's just it's almost like if you imagine a. An electrical system um, can receive that signal, and then if nothing is there to go, when re you receive that signal, anticipate a bad thing. If the, if the bad thing never comes, that you can just like that's just noise. You can just get get rid of that mm. signal. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of why that's kind of why I would say that sort of the down regulation of a do you, do you know what I mean? So that would be that would kind of fall under the sort of down regulation of behavior in response to like a stimulus without the reinforcement of it. So that's kind of where I would say down regulation is maybe not the best word to use when describing these other criteria because it kind of more accurately describes this associative learning or sorry, uh, uh, habituation, the sort of non-associative learning. Mm. And then the eighth sort of criteria is behavior that shows that the animal values painkillers when injured. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So I'm saying painkillers, but it's anal anal analgesics, analgesics, analgesics. I don't know. Analgesics. There you go. Um, never look up how to pronounce a word because <laughs> I always forget. Anyway, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, showing that the animal would like seek out painkillers um, when um, when injured. And do non sentient? Do they not? Do they not do that? Well, they might do that, but they might not do some of the other ones. But like, do I mean, bugs not get addicted to painkillers, for example? I, as far as I'm aware, I I, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. But um, I would doubt it because we don't probably don't consider bugs as being sentient. Um, but I mean, 
the way that these criteria work is that they've um they've basically looked at the data and based on like sort of um, how much data there is on it like they can and and how they've got basically confidence confidence scores for each individual sort of um criteria and uh if there's not very much data then they've got a low confidence um if there's a lot of data then they can give a high confidence answer um one way or the other um whether it's like whether they like they meet the criteria or not um and then based on that however like you look at then the number of like those criteria that they've got sort of a high confidence of like actually meeting in um and you can then sort of determine whether it's something is sentient based on that right so you look at each individual criteria and then you look at them all together and you think this is probably like these are probably sentient mm. does that make sense mm. Mm. yeah it's a really funny one because um you can imagine like basically two different sides of this where you can imagine for example a biological system which acts as though pain hurts but only in order to protect the the biological system right so you could construct a robot which mm. can sense when it's being damaged and runs away from the damage and that doesn't require any sub like central self-consciousness like con like yeah like a, a consciousness to do it it's just a response but then you can also imagine being conscious and things like pain receptors never actually affecting your consciousness so pain doesn't matter to you yeah this is the, this is the difficult thing right because when we talk about so like i think i really i'm using pain receptors as a short as a shorthand um and that's not necessarily the most accurate way of describing it they really are sort of n like sort of nociceptors because it is not we associate pain as like sort of the bad feeling yeah right? mm -hmm. the bad feeling that comes that comes along with um an indication of damage so like you can have nociceptors that go off when uh skin is broken or when there's too high of a heat or when there's too acidic an environment right mm. and ultimately those are all neutral messages being sent to your body right in the same sense that like this is warm this is cold mm -hmm. this is warm so warm it is damaging this is so cold it is damaging mm. right those are all neutral signals to be sent is just that we are sentient and so the the signals that are sent that cause harm feel bad right yeah. like they feel bad yeah and that is kind of like why we why we do it. I'd like whereas if you think of an ant it's probably harder to think of sort of an ant engaging in behavior because it feels bad or good we were kind of talking about this before weren't we where it seems more like an ant engages in behavior just because if that makes sense. Like automatic behavior. Yeah, like automatic. Like there's no there's no feeling or drive towards it. There's just it just is. It's, it's just one. executing code yeah. almost, right? Whereas with us, it feels more like like pain is really annoying because like you can be consciously aware like of where the pain is coming from and like how um and how like sort of uh like what is causing it and how much damage there is. Like I can cut my finger. Right, like I've cut my finger before, and I'm like, okay, this is fine, but my body's still telling me, hey, there is a break in the skin here, Ouchy. and it makes you feel bad. I'm like, yeah, I know, but can like, you know, just like it's maybe not, like it's not gonna kill me. Exa it's exactly, fine. do you know what I mean? So like, there is that, there is that, there is that sort of feeling of pain that is almost hardwired in, right? Like you, pain feels bad. It's not just a neutral thing, like it is a bad feeling, and that is kind of the key there. That like you have feelings associated with these sort of response uh, these sort of like um stimuli if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah yeah cool and so there's uh, and uh, that's and these criteria are, obvi are obviously not perfect right like yeah. and uh, to go through them again quite human centric as well They're, i mean it's almost we're measuring the degree to which animals respond to pain stimuli in a similar way to humans respond to pain yeah. stimuli i mean if what is sentience and consciousness if not that essentially you know what I mean? Like, what is our estimation of sentience and consciousness, consciousness if not um, uh, a sort of, like, view of how similar to us other things are? Especially when we talk about intelligence, right? So, you look at, um, you, you look at like, a measure of intelligence, it's tool use. Oh, crows are very smart because they can use tools. Oh, octopuses are very smart because they can use tools. But ultimately, why is that, why is that a positive trait that we are, we are looking for? Do you know what I mean? In some sense, the best way to sort of rank or view organisms is based on how good they are at um, continuing life. Yeah. Because you could absolutely, um, over the course of a few million years, evolve the ability to recognize a tool and use it 
as an automatic response. If, it, for example, it's a stone, you because like intelligence in terms of that, in terms of using a tool, like me using a hammer, like I don't have any code within my brain that knows how to recognize. Like the, I wasn't born with code to recognize a hammer and use a hammer. So it's kind of to a certain extent it's a measure of intelligence because I have had to um, build a model post birth of mm. a hammer and ha what effect the hammer has and how I use that hammer. But ten million years from now, um, we could have it is technically possible as long as hammers continue to exist in the environment we could selective like s over the course of millions and millions of years selectively breed for um recognizing hammers as early as possible after birth and being able to use them so a crow or a spider or something could be able to recognize a stone and use a stone to break something um in a non-intelligent way i.e it could be a behavioral pattern that the eyes picks up the general shape of a stone and the, in the case of a spider, the little sort of spidery arm grabs the stone and bangs against something without that being something it has learned and picked up post-birth. I guess that I, that feels why we use tool use to be a um, measure of intelligence, but it might that might be wrong. I think, well, the, the, uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah. If, I mean, if what you're saying is that we use tool use as a measure of intelligence because it requires problem solving, essentially. Right. All I mean is that, that it could be non intelligent Like the use of a coconut as a shelter for an octopus could be um, a a um, behavior that the octopus is born with, as opposed to a, a behavior the octopus gains throughout its like lifespan. A hermit crab, yes, exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But I think the key point is that it, yeah, it is the, the intelligence is the gaining of like that. Um, it, well, intelligence I think is really more the elasticity to be able to. Um, engage in new environments and sort of uh, again problem solving is the key word here right because mm. it is the ability to um, use information to gain access to something or to protect oneself from something um, in a new in in novel ways yeah ways that you aren't born with yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, or, or the, rather ways that, I mean you say ways that you aren't born with yeah sure but maybe also ways that you aren't like explicitly taught um, yes. Through sort of parenting, right? Because like, yeah. I could come up with. I'm pretty sure that I could probably come up with like a hammer. Not like specifically, like, but you know, like the idea of hitting something with something else. Pretty sure I can figure that one out. You know, even if I hadn't been taught about it, I'm pretty yeah. sure I could probably figure out. You, you, there's, you know, there's a lot of things you could probably figure out um, if you weren't taught them. And what's interesting about humans is that we've gone to this point of like, we have taken this idea of like. Um, raising young and teaching young to an extreme degree wherein we, there is so much knowledge that we just shove into people's heads from the age of like kids know about planets why how what yeah, yeah. like kids know about fire and that it is dangerous and that it is hot and it can cook things and it can get rid of things people the kids know about like water and like all the uses for like uses <laughs> for that kids know about saws kids know about hammers and yeah. nails and screwdrivers and all of these different things that like if any one person had to figure it all like think about every single yeah. bit of scientific knowledge that we've got if any one yeah. person had to figure it all out they could not we'd be starting back from the start again uh, yeah and also if we lost all the knowledge and started again we wouldn't we wouldn't automatically have it like not like we are born fundamentally the same as we were born thousands of years ago it's just that we have a constant store of we have all the information to quickly download all the all the stuff we've learned. Yeah, I feel like, uh, and uh, this, I'm I'm not so sure if we are born exactly the same as we were thousands of years. I'd, I'd like I won't go out on a limb and say, and say that, but, but what I mean is, we're not born able to do nuclear physics. Yeah, um, no, no, yeah. So what, if we what, were born without any nuclear physics, it would take us all that time to refigure it out again. Oh gosh, I can't remember what this was. It was someone. It was someone asked the question: How far back can you go, um, like, and take someone out of time before they wouldn't be able to engage in human society appropriately? And I think like there were some Neanderthals who would basically who could exist in human society, but would have like like a noticeably low IQ. Yeah, if that sure, makes sense. Sure. But it's really interesting. So what you're saying there is something that I find really interesting. So you wouldn't think about this, right? But like you could go back in time. You could pluck Cleopatra, and you could probably teach her how to drive. Now, yeah, right. That seems weird. She <laughs> not have so chariots. Weird. Yeah, but what I mean is, uh, driving a car and driving a chariot, or do you know what I mean? They're yeah, very different I things. I couldn't drive a chariot. No, but you could learn, right? So Probably, yeah. you could pull someone out of time, and you could pull people out of time for a lot, like way, way, way back. Even though you think of them as being like not as 
intelligent or not as knowledgeable, you could pull someone out of time and say, okay, now here is all of the scientific knowledge we have. Here's how to drive a car. And they could, they could integrate into society. The, like the difficulty, like you, if you were to steal a baby from like, I don't know, like 5,000 years ago. Yeah. I reckon you could probably, I reckon you could probably raise it as a, they could do some of the jobs. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, that's insane. Mm. Feels very weird. Mm. Cause we think of, like, like what you're saying, we think of it as being that not sort of knowledge as being static. Like we have progressed, but actually the knowledge has progressed. Yeah. We have changed a bit, but we not as much as the knowledge progress. has changed. Yeah. yeah. But that's why brain, that's what brains are for, isn't it? Is they're, they're good at downloading information that the body and brain, that like a brain is like a general purpose thing. That's it. Yeah. 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 It's a general purpose. To, it's what well, you say you're able to learn to do things that you weren't born with. And what I was, what I wanted to sort of interject was that. Well, I mean, technically, you're born with the ability to do that. If if that makes yeah, sense, yeah. But I mean, only in the same way as I'm currently. My I was born as a baby with the potential to do stuff that hasn't been discovered yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, yeah, yeah. So what I mean is, like, your brain is built to be able to learn to do those things, but it's not built to be able to do those things. So in the sense that a spider is built to produce Make webs. Web. Um, not just physically, but also yeah. sort of like um, it's more sort of hardwired into them to to make webs. Yeah, you can do that. You can just learn to do it. I'll just learn to make a web. That's fine. I'll do that. Um, in the same way that like a sort of kangaroo boxes. I don't think it. I, I don't think a kangaroo necessarily learns how to sort of like you know do yeah. it sort of thing. It might observe its parents boxing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but then like I can learn to. I can watch a kangaroo and learn to do what the kangaroo does, and also learn any number of martial arts. Yeah. You can just do that swimming you just can't swim but we can we can't innately swim we can't we innately ride a bike but we can yeah. just it's actually a really good leveler in terms of like if you're looking at somebody who's incredibly good at something yes they may have been born uh with a slightly different body or brain um so they are particularly adept at a specific skill but a decent chunk of their ability is just practice yeah uh, at, for a very long time so if you're looking at someone and going oh man i wish i could do that well, they couldn't at some point, and you probably, if you were plonked into their life with your brain and your set of skills, you'd probably be quite good at it too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always something you're going to be good at as well. Anyway, yeah. Just whatever you find interesting to put the time into. I noticed that with um, like, m- like us being podcasters and being very comfortable being on camera and talking and mm. thinking live. Um, that's something that I couldn't do at one point, and probably quite a lot of people have the potential to do, but just haven't done it and haven't practiced it. Yeah, I th- as well. I think the issue is that you you go into something and you see people being very very good at it, and you think, well, I'll never be that good. And so when you're 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 judging yourself against these people that have been doing this for years, <laughs> and then you you end up not wanting to do it anymore. And then, yeah. oh no, I've I can, you can you can never get it that good if you sort of cut yourself short and don't let yourself try. Like we the, the difference that we've had in the past what, almost three years is insane. This this show was always good. It used to be a lot less good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, so it is incredible. I mean, we should get back to this sort of sentience thing. Um, so just to run through those eight criteria, again, we've got uh, basically pain receptors, but remember it's not like specifically pain receptors because pain is like a, it's that kind of more uh, sort of sentient feeling. So nocy receptors, the, the receptors that sort of tell you when something's going wrong in the body integrative brain regions and connections between those brain regions and the sort of nocy receptors, uh, the nocy receptors, the pain receptor sort of things. Um, and then four responses that are affected by potential local anesthetics or, uh, painkillers. Um, so basically your, whatever you, your sort of response to stimuli can be affected by painkillers. Um, um, five motivational trade-offs between the cost of threat and the potential benefit of um, obtaining resources. Six flexible self-protective tactics used in response to injury and threat. Seven associative learning, um, basically learning that goes beyond just not doing something when you don't get when you're um, not getting the um, <laughs> the response that um, <laughs> encourages it. And eight behavior that shows that the animal values painkillers when injured. Um, and the thing is that none of these single criteria say ah this is sentient this is yeah it. right um but uh the issue the, the, the sort of idea is as i said more to build up a picture of whether whether the thing is sentient mm-hmm. or not mm-hmm. based on how many of these it meets and how strongly it meets them yeah. um and what's because quite a few of those 
quite a few that can individually be explained away, but when they're combined, yeah. they can't. That's the key point. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's the, that's the thing. Like you're saying, it's very hard to sort of say, how do we know this is feeling something? It is very hard to say that. But looking at all of those, those eight, it's very hard to say that it's not feeling. Do you know what I mean? Mm. As in, you have to come up with something that explains the situation better. And a whole host of automatic responses that, um, that explain that kind of behavior is really difficult. But ultimately, I think it gets to the point of being almost um, irrelevant. Like, we can talk about this in a bit, but like, it gets to the point of almost being irrelevant because, like, it's interesting because the purpose of life is really to make more life to continue the process of life as it were and we as humans because we're we've got this silly little consciousness we get all bogged down and whether like oh meaning is it oh is it, are, are things sentient are we conscious what is conscious it doesn't matter just make a baby make it good and make yeah, it make more but it does it, but but when we're talking about pain we're not talking about um interrupting life's ability to self-replicate and mm. produce more of itself. We're not going like, oh, we really shouldn't get involved in the cow's propagation of the cow gene. We are talking about, and taking as very important, the qualia, the subjective experience of pain. Mm -hmm. That is what we, I think, what we're talking about and what matters. If it turned out that cows very much act like they're in pain, but they actually don't care. The subjective, the brain behaves... Plants. The, plants. the brain behaves as if it's in, plants behave as if they are. That's what I'm saying. You're experience. describing plants. Yeah, yeah. Um, like if a cow was uh, mooing when it's in pain and actively moved away from pain, um, and its behaviour was was uh, changed based on whether it anticipated pain, and yet for some reason the subjective cow consciousness didn't actually feel any of that pain, we'd probably be like, uh, okay, it's fine then. It's plants. Yeah. That is kind of, yeah, that is plants. Plants and fungi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't know. Fungi might have some form of consciousness. Um, no, no, what yeah. I mean is that that is how we are dealing with them right now. Yes. Yeah. What I would really love is for us to discover that plants were plants and fungi were also sentient to some extent. Why would you love that? Wait. That would increase the suffering. <laughs> it wouldn't increase suffering. The suffering has always been the same. But it would increase the suffering we think we're inflicting. Because it'd be really interesting to me to see what the vegan argument would turn out to be. Yeah. Because like, what, what, where would they go? You know, they'd just start eating dirt. I mean, what would you? And uh, to me, I I don't what think if dirt was sentient. Like, because they, I think <laughs> just fucking. No, because I think that, <laughs> I think that I think this, the the argument could still make sense. It's reducing harm as much as is yeah. possible and practicable. Yeah, yeah. It's just that yeah. this is as little as we can do. Right. We just have to ask the plants. And ultimately, like what at some of the plants, some parts of plants are actually made to be eaten, as in they have evolved to be eaten. That's Oops. what we need. Yeah, we we become we become uh, those those fruit air, fruitarians that only eat the apple after it's dropped. So we're like, okay, we'll wait wow. for the plant to the, the thing to drop the plant, drop the fruit, and then we eat the fruit. In case the snap hurts the tree, like the snap No, no, it's supposed to. That's supposed to. It's snap giving off. agency to the tree because the tree's decided oh. to drop. It's the tree like hasn't decided. Tree's like, no, of course, but like anthropomorphizing it for a moment. Sure. The tree has dropped its apple. It is no longer claiming ownership over the apple, so we can take the apple. Yeah, so long as we plant the seeds. Yeah. Right? Or we eat the seeds and poop them. Sure. That's planting them. Directly into soil. Yeah. Not if you plant and poop them into your toilet. That's, well, that's why we've got to plant them, because yeah. otherwise we're, okay. you know, taking away that. But it's really interesting, right? Because, like, that, that is... I don't know, I just find that an interesting thing. <gasps> I just realized, okay, so if you have an apple and a seed, right? <laughs> One view of the apple and the seed is that the seed eats the apple. So it's like a source of energy for the seed, right? But then plants... Mm, the seed doesn't eat the apple. Does it not? No. So oh, No, I understand that fruit are designed to be eaten. So like sometimes a plant might... Okay, apple's a bad example. But sometimes a plant might um, encase its seed in something that then can be... Feed, feed for the, the the plant, right? Is that peas? Okay, so the way that seeds work is that seeds are, effect, are essentially eggs. Um, you have an outer casing um, uh, that protects the seed. Mm. Uh, then you've got the, uh, the part of the seed that is used as a food store mm -hmm. for the plant itself when it's about to grow. So um, that's what you eat when you eat peas. That's why we eat sunflower seeds because there is just a food store there for the plant to grow before it can start making its mm -hmm. own food. Um, and then obviously when you plant the seed, what happens is um, it like the little shoot bursts out of it. And how is it growing and becoming a little shoot when it's not even green yet? It can't get to the sun. It's that energy store. Yeah. So all seeds have an energy store because that's how the plants grow. In the same way that all eggs have an energy store. That's what the, um, that's what the, is that the yolk? 
Yeah, that's what the yolk, I'm pretty sure it is. So the seed of, a, for example, an apple mm -hmm. doesn't use the apple as an energy store. No, no, no. So the apple is actually the, comes, so fruits come from the ovaries. I think it's the ovaries. From the ovaries of plants. Um, and, uh, and this isn't just fruits that are meant to be eaten because there are many different kinds of fruits, botanical fruits. There are many, many different kinds. There's fruits that explode seeds out, all these mm -hmm. different things. But um, so when you, when you talk about a fruit with seeds in, um, like an apple, like berries, like that, the outer part of that fruit is to be eaten by animals so that yeah. the seeds can be transported around. The seeds don't eat the, the seeds, the seeds, the, their food store is inside the seed. Yeah. Everything that a seed needs is inside that hard casing. So it's because the seed, again, to anthropomorphize, wants to be in poo. It doesn't want to be, it doesn't necessarily want to be, it just wants to be transported somewhere. Somewhere else. Somewhere else. Oh, I see. The, it, the, the, you know, that, is a, that, is, that, is, that is a benefit yeah. because it can act as a fertilizer, but, um, but it, it like that is not quite a necessity, right? It's mm. the, the the main thing is generally that an apple tree can't move, so it then utilizes things that can move to take its seeds somewhere mm -hmm. else, so that it's not competing with its own young. But then some fungi do want to be in poo. Sure, but yeah. fungi aren't plants. So. No, yeah. <laughs> but they don't have a, a food store, do they? Or, or some of them don't. Like the the. Sp the spores they like fly away and they land on something and use that as their food source so that they're very different um in the way that they produce energy so uh, fungi tend to consume to an extent to break down um decaying yeah. matter yeah right and that's where that's why you get um that's really where you get sort of molds and whatnot growing on off and rotten foods mm -hmm. and like you see them growing around trees and stuff in forests because they're they're feeding off of decaying material essentially whereas plants produce their own energy mm. um and any of the plants that you see that eat other things they are only eating the other things not to gain energy but actually generally to gain nutrients um like nitrogen and whatnot mm. so back to the sort of sentience thing um so essentially what they like i said what they've done is they've they've determined the sort of confidence that they've got for um all of these different criteria um, and it's interesting because they use low confidence when there's little evidence or there's sort of no evidence. Uh, sorry, they use um, uh, very low or no confidence when there's like r no evidence or there's inadequate evidence. But interestingly, um, it doesn't mean that sentience is unlikely or disproven. It just means they don't have evidence. And in all of the cases that they looked at here, um, they they actually there was there was no instance where they had a lot of evidence. And they did not find the animal to be sentient. So they looked. At, so what they did is they looked over over three hundred scientific studies, um, and obviously these were only about the like the sort of animals that they were looking at. So like decapod crustaceans, like mm. lobsters and crabs, and um, and uh, cephalopods, octopuses, squids, cuttlefish, uh, because they specifically decided to look at ones that uh, they thought would be sentient. Um, they ended up finding that pretty much all of them that they had the evidence for were sentient. They never had a... I think it's interesting that they didn't have a case where they were looking into something. They had a lot of evidence and they found, oh, it's not sentient. So how do you get from, yeah, high likelihood of sentience here, to, but let's not change any of our behavior with regards to this animal. So, <laughs> uh, what the what actually happens here, What they had suggested and recommended um, outcomes from their evaluations. Um, so... I will read this out verbatim. The authors make a strong recommendation that all cephalopod mollusks and, de and decapod crustaceans should be regarded as sentient animals for the purposes of UK animal welfare law. <clears throat> and then, uh, <clears throat> they also provide very helpful recommendations regarding commercial practices. They recommend against declawing, nicking, eye stock ablation, and the sale of live decapod crustaceans to untrained, non-expert handlers, and they include suggestions for best practices for transport, stunning, and slaughter. Uh, they suggested to change a whole lot of things, but the way that the and I read this from the gov web, the the uk.gov uh, website or whatever it is, um, essentially, they've said that future legislation or future like implementation will go by this, but nothing has changed up until this point. Because this is the thing yeah. I find incredibly strange, and this is something we've noticed um, over the last few years with the current situation, mm -hmm. uh, which we will not mention by name, Good. Um, for the YouTube algorithm. Um, but but we have shown, our governments across the world have shown that when there is the will, we can do massive amounts of change. Yeah. We can upend the entirety of our economic system. Yes, in the short term, but we can do an awful lot of 
difference when we have the will. And yet we've got all this evidence of climate change and we've got all this evidence of massive suffering um, for animals and we don't know do anything. We're just like, oh, we'll we do care. things Have you slowly. seen Don't Look Up? I have, I've started watching it this morning. Oh, it's really? Been, it's yeah. very good. I watched it last night. But isn't that incredible? Like we just, we just, like when it comes to climate change, we could have the same level of massive uh, social change um, and and we just aren't doing it. And the same thing but with I, animals. And I think that will come how eventually. How do we make money? Uh, well, we, but we didn't make, we had a quite a large drop on GDP because of the current situation. Um, yeah, but that was because people were dying. Like, how do we make, but how do we make money? Uh, well, we make money by printing it and entering it into a computer. Um, that's obviously not a good long-term strategy. <laughs> what you're asking is how do we make resources and how do we make wealth, right? How do we make like stuff to consume and stuff? To, yeah, yeah, well, we need, to, we need to consume stuff, Luke. No, we do need the to world, consume some stuff. But no, the world can never... Like, can, Are you telling me that we're going to just stop producing an excess of stuff for no reason? Mm. That seems ridiculous. No. The planet can die so long as we have more stuff than is necessary. <laughs> Where will the jobs come from? Louise, <laughs> but but it's it's weird, isn't it? It's like uh, like th in the case of anim animal sentience, like that is obviously on our governments around the world list of priorities, fairly low. But when it comes to the current situation, uh, or when it comes to global warming, um, that's starting to get quite high on the um, on the uh, the level of of interest um, of us doing things about things, although. You know the threshold over which we start doing something is is even higher <laughs> than the list is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is. It does seem super strange. I think that day will come. It's just that in the case of global warming, it'll come too late, and we'll have to way overcorrect. Um, but in the case of animal sentience, it's like um, we've got all this evidence here. Uh, the day has come. What are we? What are we doing? Yeah. What well, are we doing about it? <laughs> nothing. Why? Why would we? I mean, this is this is what's really frustrating is that we need to have, we can we can have scientific evidence that hey maybe maybe harming these other things is bad for them and they don't like it. Yeah. And still, the government can the government to shut people up will say, yep, we've declared them sentient, and everyone's like, wow, octopuses are sentient, not knowing that what that means, thinking oh we've decided that octopuses are like us, but mm. actually what we've decided is octopuses can feel pain. But we don't but care. But we're not going to do any much, very much about it. <laughs> yeah, I suppose because the thing is, is, we're not even doing anything for a lot of the humans that are in pain. So yeah. why would we do anything for the octopuses? Even the other animals that have been sentient for declared ages. sentient for ages. Like, yeah. think about it. People think of like octopuses were declared sentient because mm. they're like, oh, sentient being like humans. Because I know that octopuses are very intelligent. They wouldn't necessarily think that cows are sentient in that context, right? Cows are sentient. We're we're just not allowed to, you know, mistreat them. Too much, yeah. But you can still have that involves like, killing. Places yeah, limits. Kill. And I actually, I watched a really interesting documentary with it. I can't remember this lady's name, but I watched this really inter interesting documentary. With this lady who's like put her like she's dedicated her life to um, like the really interesting um, design of um, slaughterhouses, for example, in order to reduce like the fear that cows. Oh, so they don't see that their other cows are being killed. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, um, it, it, it's like exploits. The psychology of cows to like go around a corner or something like that um to like when they can't see where they're going they'll keep walking it's really really interesting mm. um even like speaking of somebody who doesn't eat this stuff it, i'm obviously interested in reducing the suffering but also part of the uh justification for it was like well if the cow's scared then the meat's ten ten uh, not oh i was tender. gonna say that yeah the cow the cow that ruins the meat if you yeah. scare the animal but this that's lady, why they're doing it yeah but this lady did say like uh, obviously, there are lots of people who choose not to eat meat, and I really respect that. I choose to eat it, um, but I'm trying to reduce the suffering of those animals too. And I thought that was really interesting. It's fine. I don't know. I feel like, well, that's that's something. That... A few years ago, I was in work uh, at the office job that I had, and there was a lot of white people. Um, I wouldn't quite say fully racist or Islamophobic completely. Ignorant. But... No, beyond that. Heavily ignorant. Uh, what I'm saying is, I wouldn't say complete out and out Islamophobes, but they right. are Islamophobic. Okay. Okay. So there was a conversation being had in the office about, oh God, food, uh, about how halal meat was just, just despicable. It's disgusting. Can you believe what they do? Mm. They, they hang them up and they drain them of their blood. Disgusting. And I was like, you guys are killing animals too. You, you realize that? And they were like, yeah, but I'm like, no. 
No, the the level of bad starts and <laughs> starts and ends at I am killing this thing that I don't need to. Yeah. You have such a huge issue with the way that you don't have an right. issue with the way that like so, Muslim people kill the you have an issue with Muslim people. You kill any and animals you use too, you that yeah. to justify the fact that you don't like Yeah, it's like have you ever had veal? Have you looked like, into how your meat is slaughtered? Yeah, like it's like have you looked into how it's raised? Are you telling me that you that you buy like you 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 like uh, personally make sure that every single bit of meat that you buy comes from a very very good farm where they're all well treated. No, you don't. And even if you do, the only reason that you can do that is because you've got the money to do it. Like, and you also might eat halal meat. You probably yeah, probably you do. Have no idea. They just honestly. <laughs> it's just that halal meat is required for for Islam, but oh you might God. eat like you might eat halal meat. Yeah, you apparently have... a lot of store meat is halal just what, just by accident. Sure, that wouldn't yeah. be surprising. Well, they, 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 easier, yeah. they don't necessarily. Yeah. They don't necessarily label it as hello. It's just, sh just shut up, honestly. Yeah. When you, it's when people that eat meat try to start taking the high road <laughs> on what kinds of meat. Like, I genuinely, and like, I kind of get it, but like, I mean, it comes when it, when it, for me, I'm just like, unless you're sort of killing your own, killing your own meat, uh, killing your own animals, or um, sort of like going to a sort of local farm and getting that. And you know how it's and done. And you know exactly how it's done. Shut up. When, yeah, we're not telling you to not do it. We're just saying don't try and take the high road. Yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> I am perfectly, I fully respect people that eat meat and say, yeah, I I have no justification for this. I like it. That is that is far more, um, that is far that. more acceptable to me yeah. than someone who tries to like tell me that, well, actually my meat is sustainable and it's better than, <laughs> shut up. No, it's not. No, it's not. You know how much farmland vegan people need? You think of it like all the processed meat, the vegan, and we're just eating a cow. What do you think is one? What do you think is being fed to your cow? And yeah. Two, wh what is wrong? You realize processing foods is not bad inherently. Yeah. Right? Like it's not. Oh, gosh. There's a really good video on this actually by Kurt Skazak called uh, Is Meat Really That Bad? Oh, yeah. And I, every time I see a video of that, like I, I go to it and I'm like, Oh God, this is what you do, Corey, when you are, um, like someone comes to you with a, a, an argument that you, is a counter to something you believe, mm. and you go away and you're like, oh God, maybe they're right, and you research it. Every time I see a video called, is meat really that bad? I'm like, oh no, is it going to tell me that actually it's not that bad? And then pretty much all the time it's like, nah, yeah, yeah. it's that bad. Is that bad? And I'm like, oh, phew. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I ever see people saying meat isn't that bad, it's when... It's it's with all these sort of uh, buzzwords and phrases and uh, go to statements that, that I know are wrong. Do mm. you know what I mean? Like as in, you know, people pointing out, oh, well, the vegan foods are, are are processed. Do you know how much water is required to produce? Do you realize that there is not? It is not possible for every single person on this planet to eat the amount of meat that people generally do um, in sort of the Western countries, and also have all of that uh, all of that meat be grass fed and sustainable. Mm. And not cruel. Yeah, and yeah. not cruel. Like it's it's not. So you're gonna have to feed them soy. Why not just feed us soy? Like it's really tasty. What bothers me is that the most simple concept of biomass does not seem to get through to these people. Yeah, you were taught it in GCSE biology. Yes, which is like the ten to one. Every time you feed something to an animal, and then you eat that animal, you lose like oh, ninety percent yeah. of the en energy. Yeah. It just feels like people think that cows are coming from nowhere. Yeah, they pop out of nowhere. There's the cows are there. Well, you don't they, need to feed them anything. Is that what you meant? Like the food chain? Yeah, you lose 10 that's to one. exactly what I meant. Yeah. yeah, I remember learning. I remember so well learning that in literally, I think GCSE GCSE biology. Yeah, and it winds me up because I think you, you need to give a cow a lot of. A, Cows are much bigger than us. They have to be warm. And, but you need to give a cow so much energy to make cow. Yeah. yeah. And also because it doesn't just use all that energy to make cow, it uses energy to keep cow warm. being cow. Yeah. Right? And move around. And Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of wasted energy there. And then when you eat cow, there's even more wasted energy between like you eating cow and it becoming you and you using that energy. Just eat what cow eat. Yeah. Just eat the thing. <laughs> Yeah. Just or use the land that you're using to raise all this stuff, and it 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 just oh my gosh, it's insane. It baffles me honestly that that people just don't seem to get that very like that I simple concept is it. like the nail. I think in they the... just use little mental gymnastics things to get around the things they already know. But if they just said, "I just like eating meat," yeah, I'd I'd be like, "All right, I can't fault that. You live in a world where meat, eating meat is normal. I respect that. That's fine. Kinda like, I, fine. I, I like." I mean, I genuinely enjoy meat. I like it. Sometimes I think about, well, wouldn't it be nice to be stuck on a desert island because at least then I could kill and eat a pig. Like, that'd be lovely. No, but I mean, like, I think, about, honestly, I think about the, the situations wherein I would actually eat meat and I would eat meat if I had to. I don't oh, mind. Yeah. Like, and when I say have to, I don't mean like, oh, there's nothing else on the menu. I mean, like, I will kill an animal. I don't care. 
Like, I don't care that. What a psychopath. I mean, like, I, I don't care. I don't care <laughs> that, that much that I. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't care so much that, like, if it was the choice between me killing an octopus and like me me dying, of course I'd kill the octopus. Sure, sure. Like. I'm, I'm not going to go out of my way to be vegan. And the octopus like, is going to try and not get killed. That's, that's Exactly, that's, that's it. That's the light, that's it's, nature. It's, it's fine. Like, so <laughs> you're I don't living think at like base nature there. It's like, stop <laughs> fighting and like, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm that's not quite, the... It's like, well, oh, wow, I get to be like a monkey for a bit. Exactly. <laughs> Come here, octopus. Octopus is like, no, please. Square eggs at you. You're like, ah, I can see through your egg. <laughs> 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 I'm, not so, yeah, I'm not some bleeding heart vegan that's thinking like, oh, I don't want to ever harm anything ever. No. I will kill and eat you if I have to. I don't care. I just don't have to. Yeah. That's the only right. thing that has stopped me from eating another person. The fact that I haven't known. <laughs> I don't need to yet. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm keeping up with Cory in the apocalypse. <laughs> so um, some of the things that they have suggested to um, modify or stop for uh, cephalopods um, is... Um, yeah. Yeah, is yeah, the we yeah, cephalopods, yeah. yeah is the <laughs> slaughter of cephalopods. Uh, so there's lots of different slaughter methods that um, uh, are used in Europe, including clubbing, slicing of the brain, reversing the mantle, and asphyxiation in a suspended net bag. Um, we are not able to recommend any of these methods as humane. Um, there's, <laughs> gosh. So for all of the slaughtering methods for cephalopods right now, there is not one that is both humane and can be done at a large scale. Hmm. So. Surely the only conclusion is... Continue doing the thing that no. makes you feel good. No. Continue... No. Not I'll give you a stopping... No. The... I'm really struggling here. What, what are you saying? Because <laughs> I want to eat me some octopus. Uh, but, um, that... but I don't want to feel bad. But I, yeah, I want, I want to know that <gasps> it was killed in a humane way. I know way. what you do. What? You pay someone else to do it. Oh yeah, because I, I do it. That makes sense. Yeah, great. Yeah, cool. Sorry, don't have, to, don't have to look at it. Uh, so, <laughs> or you have smalls. You you only eat from local octopus. Like that. That always winds me up. Local octopus. Like farms. people feeling better that like, oh, I killed it in a nice way. You killed it though. Didn't want to be killed. Yeah. You know, mm. like, and you didn't have to. I let it walk outside for a bit before I killed it. That's not good for an octopus range. either, no. right? And like, <laughs> no, no, I dropped no. the octopus <laughs> in a field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, Essentially, it's that they've recommended uh, new codes of best practice and looking for new um, methods of killing. Um, octopus farming. Um, they've said that there is no octopus farming in the UK, but there is interest in it elsewhere in the world. Um, but octopuses are solitary animals that are aggressive towards each other in confined spaces. So um, high welfare octopus farming seems to be impossible. The government could consider a ban on imported farmed octopus. But... Um, that. I'm sure it will. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Ugh, gosh. And a preemptive ban on octopus farming in the UK could be considered, but would have no immediate welfare benefit. Essentially, like, they've just... They've just... They've, they've said, maybe we should stop all these horrible things we do to these animals. And nothing has really happened maybe. yet. I, I don't know. I find, like, I guess the science of this could be interesting. I mean, I think it's too much, really. I'm not saying just for our audience, but I mean, for the sort of lay the layperson... Uh, the science behind this is kind of complex and really it kind of verges more into the philosophical, the interesting part for me verges more into the philosoph philosophical aspect of what is consciousness, what is sentience. Mm. Um, so in, in the context of this story, it really is for me just a case of we, we decided that some of these animals have feelings. We're going to continue to do what we do with every other animal and not really care that much. And it seems strange to sort of introduce all these frameworks for like uh deeming something sentient legally mm -hmm. if you're not going to then act upon that information mm -hmm. um I, I i feel like at the very least a thing you could do is if you label if you have for example uh octopuses um and you in cow farming for example you've got like humane practices or more humane practices um if you have determined that there is no way of um humanely uh producing octopus meat at scale mm -hmm. um, then you have some sort of label which says that octopus meat is inhumane so if you have a menu um, you can have a label next to, next to food that says humane or inhumane and you let the market decide you let people decide if that's what you're going to leave it to if you're not going to do yeah. anything with the information at the very least give consumers the information through which they can make hu humane decisions or not yeah. Um, which we don't even have at this point. We have a system whereby people can pretend to be um, humane and moral um, just by, like I said, paying someone else to do it 
and not thinking about it. Yeah. I just find that the the idea of saying that it is humane to kill an animal, really, in any way, for an unnecessarily kill an animal in any way, I think that's just silly. It's just a little lie that we're telling ourselves, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you if there was theoretically, if there was a cow who you allowed to live a nice life, mm -hmm. and then you somehow, through some magical means, they were just instantly dead. That would be as close to humane as you could possibly get. Sure. I, I mean, that's why I don't have a huge issue with people who do, like, who run, the, who have their own farms and basically um, raise their own food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fine to me because mm -hmm. they want it to have a good life, all yeah. that sort of stuff. But and and from the perspective of the cow genome, like the gene, if we're talking, because mm -hmm. what we're talking about before is like life is like um, ultimately about about propagating um, like g genomes. Um, from the perspective of the genome, the cow, the chicken, the sheep, they those genomes have sort of teamed up with our genome to get as many as many copies of itself out. Like we are, th there are certain animals that have decided to sort of team up on Team Human, and um, they have been whether we have okay, they might not have teamed up. I, but, I would say it's more parasitic than anything, but yeah, yeah. But the, in terms of the cow population, the sheep population, the chicken population is artificially higher than it would otherwise be. Um, then those that from a genetic perspective that it is a succeeding genome no no i'm not really. saying this is the way you think no about no no i know I, what i'm saying way is that it. yeah but then the 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 only issue i would have with that way of thinking about it is that it is a succeeding genome sure but not in the wild or in any way that is beneficial to the animal like as in well but there's no such thing as the wild because no, no what, what i mean is, is so still... what i what, what i mean is that um these in in the same way that sort of pugs you know, can't breathe and have all these host yeah. of health pro problems and whatnot. It's, it, mm, I wouldn't really say it's the success of the genome because it's not really going anywhere, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, all I mean, I, I, I'm not saying this is an argument that people mm -hmm. should use for pro eating meat. I just mean that ultimately a genome doesn't care about, a genome doesn't care about the, the um, welfare of its own body its own host <clears throat> the body it uses to replicate it only cares about the success sure. of the number of copies i mean in the grand scheme of things in the whole context of life as a process and that continuing yes it doesn't matter i don't think it i don't think it's hugely important um whether we do factory farming or or, or, or eat meat at all mm. i don't think it matters it's um it's just one way of continuing life uh i just it, it, unfortunately, I'm stuck in my silly little head with my well, silly you care little about morals pain. and my silly little values. Uh, <laughs> even though none of it matters at all, so long as I make a make a thing that can make another thing, yeah. right? Like that is all that matters. And but unfortunately, we're stuck in the sort of we're stuck in this idea of things mattering outside of that. And because of that, I think it's a bad thing. Yeah. And sure, like you can explain it away, but like we don't live we don't live in that grand scheme of things world, right? Otherwise, um, like, I mean, if, if we did live in that grand scheme of things world, then we would be incredibly efficient and we wouldn't um, get bogged down with silly little wars and whatnot. You know, mm. we'd like, we'd only focus on continuing mm. our, uh, continuing life as a process for as long as possible and making it as robust as possible. Whereas right now we're stuck on making ourselves as rich as possible and feeling good. Yeah. Which, I do think it is ultimately the thing that matters. What ultimately matters is the experience that all these organisms have yeah absolutely it's just that there is yeah. another way of viewing the world which is this um quasi objective darwinian world which is about what genes want is the propagation of themselves and in that sense none of our sort of woo woo -y, uh, feelings mm. come into it whatsoever <laughs> and so yeah it's an interest you have we need to be able to talk about things in these different ways um, and we don't currently have a legal or social system which which treats as the most important thing experience. We don't. That, that, that is not the case. The drawback to that is then, well, if you start treating experience as the most emotional uh, uh, important thing, then what is to stop you from just hooking everybody up to a little, a lovely little virtual reality and feeding feeding them as much as they like and pumping them full of drugs at all times. This is the future that Mark Zuckerberg wants. Yeah, yeah, but like we're talking about what people want here, Luke. Not yeah. what, not what, not what that 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 odd specimen wants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was watching Don't Look Up the other, like as I said last night. And there's a character in it. We were watching, and we were like, which billionaire is this? Is it, is it <laughs> oh, Elon? Yes, uh, yeah. Is it is it Bezos? Is it Zuckerberg? And it, it's like a mix of all was, three. It was I a think. mix of all yeah, three. Yeah, it is. And I was like, like, like someone was like, oh no, that, that's clearly Steve Jobs. They're doing a Steve Jobs presentation. I'm like. 
No, no, that person's talking. It like they like, like they've Mark, never spoken to another like person. Mark before. Zuckerberg. Like Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> it was so spot on. Yeah. But yeah, no, um yeah, it's tough because well, what 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 do we do? You know, we we want to think about the bigger picture, but also we think too small, then we lose we, we, we basically just devolve into seeking only pleasure and caring not really caring about anything else. And is that bad? Is anything bad? Is anything good? I've studied philosophy. Ooh, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting conversation to have because like there is a balance to be struck there. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I think that making animals feel bad is not nice. Uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, you bloody commie. Try to avoid it. <laughs> feel bad when I kill moths, but they shouldn't invade my home, even though they've got no concept of home and they just <laughs> they've got no con that's why like I really dig spiders. When people kill spiders, I feel like so when people kill spiders, I genuinely like look at them differently. Because I can understand killing a fly more so because they're pests, right? Mm. Spiders provide a service in your home. Mm. They stop they other pests from fair. like you know being there. So like what are you doing? Killing a spider. I'm just scared, scared of them. Yeah, scared of them. That's that's horrifying. Perce perceived danger. I oh, know. I don't kill them. No, I know. I know. But like, I mean, I understand why people kill spiders. Yeah. But like, I do look at people differently when yeah, they kill yeah. a spider Me too. compared to when they kill a fly or another uh, something else like yeah. that, or like moths, which can like eat them. your clothes. They're also like spiders are much hard, yeah. much easier to catch than a fly. You can yeah. just collect them and place them outside and say, "Please, sir, I'm scared of you. Thank you for well, your service, but I'm scared." But also, like a spider isn't going to damage your. Property. Like it damage your property or <laughs> or like harm your life in any way. Whereas yeah. flies will lay eggs and like will be like very annoying and also like like can lay eggs in your food and yeah. like all of that sort of stuff. Moths can eat your clothes. Not very nice, is it? Um, spiders want to eat your pests. Spiders will it's like stop a cat. that from happening. Yeah. It's a cat. Yeah. Spiders are little cats with more legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. Unsung heroes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is it for this week. Why don't we move on Ooh. to? The quick, quick fire, fire quiz. quiz. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. Clever cephalopod edition. Sentient edition, maybe. Sent no. <laughs> nah, that's like half no. the episodes. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sent <laughs> but this is a sentient quick fire quiz. You can oh, feel things. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a quick fire quiz. As usual, the rules will be the same. I'll ask one question. It's one question between the two of you. If the first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I've finished asking the question wins. What do they win, champ? Nothing. Gosh, Some sentience. Right. A little drop. <laughs> a little drop of sentience. Just as a tweet. Look, what is your buzzer? Ah! ah is that you feeling pain, Luke? Yeah, it's me feeling pain. Jamp, what is your buzzer? Just my octopus impression, I guess. It's very offensive. Thank you. So the question... Octopuses have tongues? No, no. it's their tentacles. Oh, I Slipping see. Slipping and sliding around. So my question for you both is, <clears throat> what is a Nossi Scepter? Ah! Jamp. <laughs> Some kind of pain receptor in yeah. the body. Yeah, there we yeah. Go. well done. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Before we go, though, we're not done with the show quite yet. We want to thank all of our patrons. If you're not a member of our Patreon yet, why don't you go ahead and join it? Patreon.com forward slash side guys, where you can get many things. You can submit episode topics and then have those episode topics be voted on by the other patrons. Like this one was today. It was chosen by our patrons. You can also get access to After Dark, a brand new show. I mean, it's not even brand new at this point. We've been going for a few months where we talk about philosophy. So if you liked and philosophy and all the other things that, you know, we might want to talk about. So if you liked this episode, the bulk of it talking about sentience, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that on After Dark where we're not constrained by science. We can talk about whatever we want. You also get access to Sci Guys live episodes whenever you want. A whole bunch of cool stuff. You can get discounts on merch. If you've not seen our merch yet, go and check that out. Yeah, you should definitely join our Patreon. So why don't we thank our patrons? Thank you to Raf. Thank you, Casey Donald. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you to Marianne Christensen. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Maxwell Robinson. Thank you to Rosa Rodriguez. Thank you, Emma Stankvist. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Mia Allen. Thank you, Dakota. Thank you, Caden. Thank you to Jenny Thompson. Thank you, Lana Klein. Thank you, Rosa Elena Tachner. Thank you to Isabel Davies. Hooray! Woo! 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 If you would like to be thanked, as I said, head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys and join the fun. I think that's all from us this week, is it not? That is all from us this week. It is. What a wonderful January we've had. Well, I think it's now time to say thank you to all of our patrons. 
and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday, and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod over at patreon.com forward slash side guys, or you can join the community over at our Discord. Uh, and you can also find contact us at side guys pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is here, or you can send us an email at side guys pod at gmail.com. That's side guys pod, gmail.com. SideGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at LukeCutforth everywhere. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>